accueillir Alena Ledeneva, qui est professeure de sciences politiques à l'University College of London. Alena est en train d'apprendre le français, donc ça tombe bien, je vais parler en français, mais elle fera son speech en anglais. <rire> voilà. Alors, on a, on a proposé... C'est bon On a proposé à, à, à Alena Ledevna de, de venir euh, pour, pour plusieurs raisons. Euh, D'abord parce qu'on on a travaillé avec elle euh, depuis, euh, depuis quelques années et euh, euh, Alena s'intéresse à la question des frontières, notamment, entre autres, euh, à la question des administrations, du rôle de l'État. Et puis parce que Alena a lancé euh, depuis euh, quelques années maintenant un très joli projet, un très beau projet qui est le Global Informality Project. Alors, le Global Informality Project, c'est très concret. C'est deux gros volumes encyclopédiques sur euh, les résultats de ce projet qui ont été publiés à UCL Press. On va mettre les deux volumes en accès libre sur les tables si vous voulez les consulter, bien entendu, et vous aurez l'occasion d'avoir quelques discussions avec Elena éventuellement. Alors, c'était intéressant d'avoir Alena, particulièrement pour cette conférence Picard. Pourquoi Parce qu'on va beaucoup parler soit de normes, de standards, de droits, de lois, soit d'un autre côté de chiffres, de gouvernance par les chiffres, d'algorithmes, etc. Mais c'est important de voir à quel point les sociétés, les gens, les administrations résistent aussi à ça, d'une certaine manière, ou trouvent toujours des arrangements avec cet hyper-formalisme de la gouvernance contemporaine. Et Alena, justement, va nous donner cette, un petit peu cette distance et cette vision pendant, pendant, ces, pendant cette session-là. Voilà. Je ne vais pas trop prendre sur son temps et je vais lui passer la parole immédiatement. Merci, Alena. Merci beaucoup, Thomas. Um, bienvenue à tous. I am going to speak in English, though, um, if you permit me, if only because the Global Informality Project that I am delighted to present to you is currently available only in English. I would like to thank the organizers in Turkey um, and in Brussels for inviting me and the esteemed forum of the World Customs Organization Picard Conference, uh, Dr. Kunio Mikuria, um, Secretary General of the World Customs Organization, who has actually endorsed our project. And if you see the volume two on the back cover, you will see his number one endorsement of our findings. And particularly, I want to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Thomas Cantons, who is a longtime colleague and also influence. I am delighted to uh, present um, the under the radar practices today, something that a lot of people know about, but they are rarely spoken. They are the practices that emerge bottom up, practices that work. Now, um, that's how the whole picture of complexity of the project looks, and I'm going to talk you through it very quickly. However, I must say, the complexity of the project is somewhat representative of the complexity of the contemporary world, and I will not be able to cover all innovative aspects that this project covers. At a very basic level, what you see is an assemblage of hidden practices. They are a voyage for you of discovery to explore society's open secrets. It's something that all insiders know, but outsiders have no way of guessing. To comprehend the unwritten rules and hidden practices around the globe. Currently, we've got about 250 contributors. We cover practices from five continents and 
currently 70 countries, and this is an ever-growing collection of what you should have known about the world but forgot to ask. Now, practices in this collection are caught in the language of participants. This is not the concept that we are projecting top-down from international organizations to other countries. Rather, we go bottom-up and assemble what is already there. Most importantly, these practices capture problem-solving um, techniques and skills which might be instrumental to us to understand as the world becomes more and more complex. Now, my own background is Russia, and you could see it's not a small country. It also covers the most with informal practices and open secrets that I managed to discover. But we also um, have done um, a lot of research which is historical and um, goes across geographical borders. So, for example, we've established a lot of interesting um, informal practices in China. And what they are um, coming to is not only as a collection in the encyclopedia, but also as an online resource um, which is based on the wiki software. So it's informality wiki. I hope you could um, look it up at the www.in-formality.com. Now, um, to date, it looks um, like a set of entries. You basically could search it depending on which country you are interested in, what kind of uh, region or keyword. For example, if you look at the underground banking, you will find a lot of mechanisms that go across the border. Um, and look, for example, at Hawala that operates in the Middle East, India, and Pakistan. You find um, through looking at Hawala as to what similar uh, mechanisms or algorithms exist elsewhere. So it's an interactive tool. However, um, you um, will probably guess it's a project that was not easy to do. If only because respondents are really not too keen to share the know-how in their society. And this is interesting because sometimes we think about the under-the-radar practices as something petty, everyday, not substantial. But actually, because of the minor scale, those practices are often ubiquitous. They are often create a volume that is really worth paying attention to. To give you um, an analogy, for example, with anti-corruption studies that I'm familiar best, very often when you ask, what do you think, what is the most corrupt sector in the world? People say immediately arms trade or diamond trade or something like that, but actually it's construction. It's something that is very operational on the daily basis. It's just the scale is very small, but very broad. Here we've got the situation with informality which is not dissimilar to that. And when you look at the 220 entries that we've got in the two volumes, you will see for yourself how central informality is to the workings of societies. We've got um, a lot of practices in Russia because, as I said, you know, my background is Russian, and Russia actually has been a, one of the best labs. Maybe only Africa could be better. But Russia is good enough for uh, researching how to live with complexity, ambivalence, not working institutions, how to find um, know-hows of how things really work. But of course, when I wanted to expand my interest outside Russia, 
it was only possible because of people like yourself, uh, people who work globally, who are prepared to contribute to what I call a network expertise. Um, people who are willing to share the open secrets in their societies. Now, um, the usual suspects in this project for, that are relevant for customs, they are just really under the radar, practices which are easy to name, and they are so mundane, you would be bored if I told you about it. But just for the sake of um, tribute to the authors who have contributed their field research, it's about small-scale uh, smuggling. Um, it's about um, various kind of techniques of camouflage as how you um, cover up for smiling, for smuggling. It's all kind of cross-border activities that are associated with porousness of borders or uh, trade associated with the border being used as a resource. So informal markets, informal trade associated, as in this picture, across Polish-Belarusian border, right in front um, on, on the doorstep of the EU. Um, this phenomenon of Chilnoki, um, meaning shuttle traders, again, a widespread a universal pattern across the world where the border is used in order to make living for a lot of people. Um, you've got um, shuttle traders which are traveling to and fro. What differs quite a lot is how they are called. For example, in some countries, they are tourist traders. In some countries, they are armed traders. In some countries, they are called um, buyers. So um, the history of all these people, um, of course, it's regionally based. But there is a value at looking at this evidence all together and see which patterns or algorithms are actually uh, unique and universal and which are specific and local. Now, um, this is a picture from Kazakhstan, um, a very famous phenomenon of informal markets that in many ways supplied through the porous borders and um, give you a um, huge uh, potential in terms of the um, price differential. Now, um, Thomas Cantons here has contributed an entry on um, routine payments to customs official in sub-Saharan Africa, l'argent du carburant. Again, something that is, um, how can I call it, um, a customs declaration but in a very different way of understanding customs. Um, there are traditional ways of payments and gifts, which actually we witnessed this morning in this very panel. Um, gift giving is an essential part um, of a lot of um, customs around the world. And you will see in the project how essential those sociable practices are also for instrumental reasons. Now, um, how do we select these practices? We select them uh, because they are grasped in the vernacular, in everyday speech. And here we use um, Ludwig Wittgenstein's approach to the language game, uh, which suggests that if there is a language game that is shared and understood by the user community, it means the practice exists and works well. So we've assembled um, a lot of those, and um, it really is, um, it's been impressive that those practices are not only um, exist in what we thought uh, would be corrupt societies, or what we would thought were pre-modern societies, or what we thought were poor or underdeveloped societies. What we discover is that informality lies in the very core of the operation of mature democracies and markets. And I'm not now here talking about practices which are over the radar, meaning the elitist use of World Street um, trade mechanisms and know-hows in financial sector. 
or insider trading, although they are also in the book. I'm talking now about very local practices in Switzerland, in Germany, in Finland, in Sweden, in Scandinavia generally, that are actually operational in order to secure the workings of democracy and political regimes that we have there. And that, in a way, was probably the most surprising finding um, in the Global Informality Project, because in a global paradigm, it's very common to think about informality as something out there that doesn't belong in the core developed economies, but actually, that turned out completely wrong. Now, at the next level, which is um, not simply descriptive, but um, analytical, what we've discovered that comparatively, when you look at all those practices together, when you cluster them, again, in what um, could be called a family resemblance, in the sense that family looks like they all belong together because they look like each other, but they're very different at the same time. So we clustered practices in order to see um, what uh, clusters, and uh, not geographically, but in terms of the pattern of the practice, are there in the world. So we've consolidated um, this database and managed to chart gray zones and blurred boundaries um, and key divisions, actually, which are essential uh, for us to know if we are to think what effective policy is. Very often, policy thinking goes top down. What has to be done, how to measure it, how to monitor and control it, how to achieve change. What we also witness, at least that's what has become clear over the 25 years of anti-corruption reforms around the globe, that very often the best devised reforms simply do not work. Why? Because they are coming in confrontation with bottom-up practices that actually confront them because they work locally and they work so efficiently that they don't allow the reform to go through or they circumvent and divert the reform. Therefore, informality is something that we really want to know um, how to use. Now, with uh, Global Informality Project assembles pioneering research. Very often, the practices that we included were never articulated in an academic context before. Because a lot of know-hows and local practices, say, such as Torpil in Turkey, it has just never been researched because it's so mundane, so ordinary. It's just in human nature to be using personal contacts and connections and help of friends when you need something done. So to put it onto the um, academic level and into comparative context actually um, unfolds a lot of opportunities. So to identify these practices which are widely known but not articulated, to find um, an insight onto the opportunities that seem to be open, but actually not really, um, to discover multiple moralities that circumvent the informal practices because those practices are often moral to some people and immoral to the others. So what we've um, established in terms of the pattern recognition on the basis of the database that you could browse um, over there. And there is also a leaflet somewhere if you um, want to download it as a PDF because in a PDF form it's very easy to search and you could um, browse and see where your country stands in this. Um, we've established that in all richness and complexity, and 
our desire to identify different similarities, they occur in the four modes of human interactions that actually would be applicable to all policy thinking. So some of them are associated with the redistribution, um, others solidarity, market, and domination. So what we do, we establish patterns of ambivalence that work alongside those areas. So um, we have got, for example, um, emotion-driven exchanges. This is from a gift and sincere attitude to small tribute for services and payments of gratitude, all the way to um, direct bribery. We've got values-based practices of solidarity. These are solidarities within small communities that are associated more with identity and sense of belonging. As humans, we like to belong and we need to confirm our belonging on a daily basis. We also um, discovered a lot of know-how in the market um, area of um, research where we look at the survival strategies, or so-called survival strategies, associated with very simple satisfaction of human needs from informal welfare and informal dwelling and informal income all the way to informal entrepreneurship, which arguably is going to be a really big theme after the information uh, revolution in, and the new post-information era that is coming up. We also identify the power-driven forms of captation and control. Now, the paradox, um, or not, is that the invisibility and the under-the-radar nature of these informal practices are actually um, resulting in their ubiquity. So expertly practiced by insiders, but often hidden from the outside eye, informal practices are deeply rooted around the world. Now, um, I wish I could give you more examples, but we really uh, don't seem to have time for this. I just maybe wanted to um, mention the networks of dear brothers in Finland and the networks of little cousins in Switzerland, which are essential actually for the workings of democracies in these countries, but also operational for what we call structural corruption. We also found very interesting clanong uh, practices um, near Cologne in Germany and the so-called vitamin B that stands for the use of connections and the use of competitive advantage. Um, there are multiple practices in um, South Africa and um, in Africa, South America and uh, the, the Caribbean. So um, those kind of practices, they seem to be very mundane, and yet they have enormous implications for your well-being and happiness, and this is actually confirmed in the latest uh, World Happiness Reports, and not only in the underdeveloped countries. Um, just like family relations, those social ties are really instrumental in giving you life chances. But the essential finding in the project is also that they really have a constraining effect at you at the same time. What I mean to say is that there is this very interesting practice of Jantaloven in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, where people are really restrained from using their um, individuality or excellence in performance because of the equalizing effect and collective surveillance that you have over in local communities. So you have a very similar type of mechanisms actually all over Europe um, since um, 15th, 16th century um, that was spread all over Europe, but actually for some reason just stayed there in operation 
in Northern Europe. So it's um, fascinating also with informality to see not only across the globe uh, geographically, um, but also comparatively, but also look at the historical dimension and see how, for example, we could transform those practices and use them uh, for the contemporary um, situation. And that contemporary situation, and here I'm going a little bit into the bigger picture, um, is really troublesome in the sense that we've got divided societies all over the world. We've got issues of immigration. We've got rise of authoritarian regimes, um, extremism, populism, we've, which is coupled with the decay of democracies, by the way. And um, we've got what um, academics call information revolution, which comes with a new challenges for inequality management and also welfare and security issues. Vis-a-vis -vis that complexity of the world, past is no longer a predictor of the future. We could look into what informality used to be like and see what happens to it as a result of the modernization effort. But this is not to say that we have to be targeting elimination of informality as it has been done to date. Why? Because informality has very interesting algorithms for problem solving. And this is something that we know very little about. We know that there was wisdom which became knowledge, that became information, that now became big data and fake news. And it's harder and harder to actually master um, the informational um, overload these days. Um, as, um, as someone said, you know, it's not that we serve the web, it's now the web that serves us on many levels. So here, um, how does one prepare for this new post-information age era? I would say that Global Informality Project is not only a customs declaration bottom-up, where we take a careful record of techniques and skills and human algorithms for tackling problems. We could also um, see how those algorithms that make, hum uh, that make human societies work could be used for adapting to the future change. So the patterns um, underlying informal practices, they are intrinsic to us, to humans. And it's a kind of knowledge that we might need to identify when we're dealing with um, artificial intelligence being part of our societies. Informality is a proxy for adaptability. It can turn constraints into resources. It could convert crisis into opportunities. And I would like to draw your attention to what we might have missed before. In conclusion, I would like to say that we've really um, established an extraordinary network of authors all the way from historians to cyber specialists who have contributed to um, our understanding of the workings of informal practice in the cyberspace. And all the um, new type of cyber currencies and um, hacking activities and DOS attacks and the algorithms that actually um, not very different from traditional informal patterns, but operate in, in an invisible way in the cyberspace. But we are actually um, looking for more, and we are very keen to um, maybe come up with a third volume and see how is already impressive um, network that exists. And I must say, without this commitment of scholarly community, but also uh, members of international organizations, people who 
was willing to share the know-how about informality in their own um, community, we wouldn't be able um, to go far. So I invite everyone uh, present here to identify further informal practices that are not included in our collection and get in touch with us and um, the, um, try to enhance the, our own very complex picture of the world to date. And I'm just showing the slides that I spared you because um, they will be available uh, for you to have a look. But all those um, practices that are in the book um, could be viewed um, in this 2, 4, 8, 16 algorithm, which is two volumes, uh, four parts, eight chapters, and 16 analytical pieces that actually frame the um, material. But um, the blind spots, uh, which are already not so blind, uh, for example, we've identified um, a practice in Canada, but we need more. So um, please let us know at uh, informality2014 at gmail.com if you have something for us to work on. Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe we have, I mean, it's 12.15. Uh, I think that we should be back in the rooms at 1.30, but maybe we can have some room for one or two questions if some people want to raise some questions. Otherwise, I'm, Alena is here until tomorrow, so I guess that you will have many opportunities to meet her. The books will be available outside, so it's also an opportunity for you to go through the books and to, to see what, what can be interesting or to, what is missing sometimes, as you said. So it's very interesting, thank you. If there is no question, just would like to conclude by saying a big thank you. You have um, developed the strengths of language because you will see that uh, all the entries in the book are related to vernacular terms, in fact. All the language, the strengths of the language, which is a way to institutionalize uh, informality, but in a social way to some extent. Our society is, is, uh, is, uh, is making uh, informality more institutional to some extent. Um, just want to say that if it, if it was not so, so clear, just to say that because we are, there are many customs officers here from many countries, um, informality is not, and informality within the state is not just about corruption, of course. And as Alena said, but I would like to emphasize on this, the fact that there are many informal practices that are not related to corruption, that are just informal, including relationship between users, brokers, and customs officers. And, and th this, is very, uh, this is very interesting to see in the book also. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that as civil servants, we alway, always envision informality as something which is illegal and that should be eradicated. And also that was one point that was very interesting in Alena's speech is the fact that you encourage us to make a, a distinction between all informal practices. If all informal practices are out, out of the law, let's say, um, all informal practices should not be uh, eradicated as, uh, as, uh, as illegal practices, let's say. And I, I liked a lot your clustering, uh, especially enlightening the fact that some illegal practices are solidarity, uh, informal practices are solidarity, others are related to domination. And of course, this is an important guideline for all policymakers or for all civil servants. So this, this, this distinction uh, that we should make into informality. And uh, of course, you encourage us also to learn from informality. And this is also what states used to do. I mean, when states cannot formalize something that is illegal, cannot, cannot struggle against illegality, sometimes we formalize uh, what is illegal and we transform informality into something more formal. So, if there is no question, maybe we can we can. St oh, oh, please, please. <laughs> yeah, too.
do you know the ratio of trust in informal informality or uh, informal uh, information uh, ratio for the world for the literature do you know any idea uh, for the ratio well thank you very much um, the question is uh, how much we know about formal and informal Uh, you mean in, in this project, no, no, or no, just no, generally? For the world, in general, uh, we are making some uh, trade uh, in globalization, but uh, there are some information, informal uh, data in hand. Uh, right. What is that ratio? Do you know the right. literature finding for that uh, information? Well, th there is no one number um, I, I could give you for trust. I think um, a prudent academic uh, position would be you should always cross-check. If you have three or more sources telling you the same thing, it's worth considering is more or less reliable. But 100% of reliability in a contemporary world is absolutely not possible because of this whole um, idea of camouflage and fake news and um, you know the indirect use of um, whatever it is. In academic world, it, it's very, very common because we talk about societies as being socially constructed. But on this occasion, you know, when the information is fraud, we are talking about intentional construction of something that is not true. And that makes it very difficult these days to, to tackle these issues. There was one there. Yeah, there, was, there was one question there. So last question, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in your conclusion, uh, you put it so uh, clearly that uh, uh, you suggest that we can still continue to identify uh, any other informal practices. But in your conclusion, it's clear that uh, the system made me do it. Uh, it means that uh, the system is the problem. Uh, so I would rather uh, request that you come with the solutions than to carry on um, identifying others' practices. Because it's a big challenge now, it's getting global. And then we need the solution for that. While we know already the biggest element is the, the system. Thank you. An excellent question. Um, I would like to point out um, on the slide, which is not currently um, on your screen, is that we've identified um, practices that are actually justified by the system made me do it phenomenon. But what we also discovered, that those practices, they're a slippery slope into the gaming of the system. So very often the borderline is really blurred between the two. To give you an example, we came across um, an EU official in a data set uh, who considered um, you know, unofficial income or informal income being essential for having a uh, cater sur cater and uh, privately educating her four uh, children. And that is considered to be as a survival strategy, right? So where do you put that level of survival? And once you justify your own practices, you are very often on a treacherous territory crossing over to the gaming of the system. Now, I agree with you that the system is an issue, especially now that the system itself seems to be dysfunctioning and malperforming. But the idea behind this project is that we will not be able to fix the system unless we include informality in our analysis. Which is to say, any reform you could do to the system, it's like a medicine that is designed to be taken 
with water. But if you take that medicine with alcohol, entirely different effect. And moreover, if you put that medicine in a soup where the context is so rich and difficult to decode, you just don't know what happens. And very often, anti-corruption reform create more opportunities for corrupt channeling or aid programs or whatever you take it. So my point here is let's include informality and make that formality-informality ratio in the analysis much better. So thank you very much, Alena, once again. I think that we can conclude this session. And a uh, big applause again for you. Thank you very much. So we can meet, we can meet at what, 1.30 in the two rooms. I mean, there is one room here and one room just aside. Thank you.